that guy. You have to do the notes. Welcome back, everyone, to another PT Pro from the Optimal Body Podcast. I'm Dr. Dom. I'm Doc Jen. And today we're going to be talking about stress fractures in the foot, specifically the fifth metatarsal right on the outside there. Why do we get them? Why might that happen? And what can you do about it? Let's dive in. We get a lot of people who come to us with pain in the feet, specifically due to stress fractures or overuse and and starting to build these up, particularly on the outside of the foot, which is the fifth metatarsal. So that's really what we're going to dive in about today and and show you the tools and what you can do about it. However, don't forget, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't yet, because when you subscribe on YouTube, particularly, this is where you see all the exercises that we do. And we have a new one every Monday. We might even start splitting them into two. So you can get a better idea of what you're doing. And there's other YouTube videos that come out as well that are not just about podcasts or us talking, but purely exercise. So you don't want to miss out. So we get a lot of people who come to us with foot issues and continual like buildup of these stress fractures, this overload that's happening at the foot. And particularly, we get a lot of complaints on the outside of the foot, which is that fifth yeah. metatarsal head. So that's why we wanted to do a podcast on it. It happens a lot on the outside of this foot. And like you said, it's overuse. Mm -hmm. And so when we think overuse, we're thinking about like, what might we have changed? What might we be doing differently? And this happens for a lot of people. And stress fractures are hard because they take time. Yeah. (laughs) And that's the most frustrating part for people. This is bone and they heals a lot different than other tissue. And so, like you said, it takes time. Well, yeah, it takes time to heal bone and remodel bone. So when we get into like, oh, how long you might want to change your activity levels a little bit, it might seem like a long time, but that's really what we need to do when we're starting to see an injury like this. From the time you're a baby to the, yeah. through adolescence, your bones are much more able to model and mold mm-hmm. based on the activities you're doing. But again, that, that kind of makes sense to me. Like, okay, your feet might be trying to rapidly mold, uh, adapt to all of this running activity you're doing, and then suddenly you're going a little bit over your foot's capability and then you start which to develop, is what it is yeah and then you start to develop this stress injury in that fifth metatarsal bone area and again the metatarsal like if you're looking at your pinky finger the bone that's in your hand yeah right below your pinky finger we also have that's called our metacarpal <laughs> right? (laughs) Carpal meaning hand or wrist and then metatarsal meaning foot or ankle area. It's just that bone right below your pinky toe that's within your foot and you start to develop that stress injury there. Another point to continue to think about is your nutrition and your intake in that. If you're low in vitamin D, obviously that's going to have an effect on bones and your bone tissue and your bone health. So yes, we're looking at at those who have osteoporosis or arthritis and then they go into something like Zumba and that's yeah. a lot of compression on your feet and a lot of women that you know who are a little bit older a lot of times like to do it it's fun you're dancing you're working out yeah. however if you haven't been doing a lot of that compression on your feet and you already know you're prone to osteoporosis well what are you doing nutrition wise to kind of help to support your body and what can you do outside of that as well can you start supplementing with vitamin d can you go outside a little bit more throughout the day also we need to look at calorie intake so if you're not giving your body enough calories yeah. if you're not fueling your body with the nutrients that needs to support this bone tissue whenever we start to do practices or exercises to try to help or we're resting and recovering rest and recovery goes with nutrition as well and so sleep nutrition vitamin levels these all play a role into helping stress fractures as well New Year's resolution. I'm going to go yeah. do Zumba with my friends X amount of times per week, or you get it as a gift. Like, oh, here, let's take these Zumba classes. And you start really getting into it. Again, that sudden change. Like, again, the activity itself might be great, might be perfect, but maybe we start with one time a week instead of three times a week. And then, you know, we, we won't progress into this space that our feet aren't used to. Because what have we been doing prior? And all of a sudden, we're in this dance class where we're taking 5,000 steps in an hour, you know, of this dance class, that's a lot for our body to suddenly adapt to. And it's going to need all the nutrients and rest and recovery, which we're going to get into, you know, like some of the stretches and things that you could do prior to going into a class like that. And that kind of takes us into like these risk factors that were kind of noted in some of the research. Yes, we can look at running technique and we want to look at the shoes that you're wearing and are you supporting your body? However, it's all comes 
back to kind of what Dom was highlighting is how prepared and ready is your body for the activity that you're taking on? Is it a sudden change? Is it something that you gradually progressed back into? And when we start to jump back into these activities, we like to blame all the other factors outside. We like to blame our shoes. We like to blame our feet. We like to blame all these things. But at the same time, sometimes we just need to look at, well, how am I progressing within my body? And am I giving my body the time to adapt? Or you blame the activity itself. And then that's when we start to make up these things in our our head. Like, oh, I I can't run anymore. Yeah. It hurts my feet too much. When in reality, like it's not the activity itself. It's just that we tried to run 10 miles before we (laughs) walked around the block. How do we make sure that our body's prepared to go into these activities? So why don't we talk a little bit about, okay, I've got this pain now. What do I do? So that is the first thing is we do want a little bit of activity modification in the beginning. This is where you want to talk with your doctor as well and and make sure like what is really happening and what is best treatment protocol at first. It could be beneficial to get like just like a foot boot, something that helps to prevent so much movement side to side where you're still going to be able to move your ankle and it's not like a full leg boot. And that's what they were kind of finding in research as well is that, you know, people kind of preferred more of this foot brace rather than the whole short leg that covers the ankle because then you're really limited in what you can do. But if you at least have the foot one, it's kind of preventing motion side to side in the foot, but you're still like using it, walking on it, but it really is also going to not allow you to run, not allow you to walk so fast. Kind of you're forced to modify your activity for at least like a week. And it all depends, of course, on how severe yes. the injury is. A lot of the time, stress fractures or these types of stress injuries don't even show up on x-rays yep. for a while or until they get fairly advanced. A lot of the times, a doctor, an orthopedist, somebody, they might just be diagnosing it based on your symptoms, mm-hmm. saying like, oh, you have pain out here. Oh, you've just started running a lot. This is probably the beginning of a stress injury. That's when we want to catch it. And that's when we want to do the activity modification, because then you might just be able to modify and start running a little less do a little bit of stretching beforehand. It's great to, you know, get some calf stretches in, make sure that you're treating your feet well after you do these activities and maybe cut what you're doing in half or even in a quarter and see if that changes the symptoms you're feeling. And as soon as we start to feel something, early modifications and early support is always best. How can we modify the activity? And at first, that could even mean, okay, maybe you are buying new shoes. Maybe you are buying something that's a little bit more supportive and you're cutting your mileage a little bit. And I know that's so hard for those who are avid runners and people who love to do the activity that they're doing, but providing support early on and making sure that you're not tapping into the pain. And that's where we see if we do early weight bearing, early activities within our pain tolerance and making sure that we're not bumping into pain, we see a lot more improvement in how that bone starts to heal. Your pain may have gone away because the inflammation in the foot may have worked its way out. Your bone might be in a a healing process. You're not aggravating it with that stimuli of running like you were previously, where you go back and do one or two runs even, and then you just find yourself slipping back down that slide or that slippery slope again and being like, ooh, same pain came back. Then we kind of reset the counter. (laughs) And wouldn't it be so great to not have to do that so you actually wait the proper amount of time? Which yes, four to eight weeks of activity modification, it's quite a bit, but we can get creative as well. So what else can we do? So maybe I'm not running right now, but I'm doing the butt or I'm Mm -hmm. doing rowing or I'm doing something that takes some pressure off of my foot directly and I'm not putting all the weight on it, right? If you love running, get in a pool and run laps in a pool. Like I love pool running because actual running can hurt my feet sometimes so yeah and it just it completely is non-weight bearing at that point then right now let's talk about some of while you're in this healing phase (laughs) and you're already super frustrated what are some of the things that we can do we have a tool that people can use absolutely because our tissues our bones especially our feet they love space which is why we love to use toe spacers (laughs) 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 we have these little things which i love these are the gonna, Neboso Toe Splay. Socks Thing. work great. I mean, I still use socks if I'm too lazy to go up to my room and get right, this thing. Right, <laughs> exactly. It's a good start, at least. The thing about socks that sometimes gets a little weird is that sometimes the, the toes end up going in different directions because your socks are interweaving between the toes in different directions. So that's yeah. where it can get a little weird. And the thing that we love about these Neboso is that there's not as much tension, I should say, within the space between them. So it doesn't 
feel like it's cutting off circulation within your toes <laughs> and it doesn't feel so aggressive so you can wear it for about 10 to 15 minutes a night without it doing too much. And someone had reached out to me and said that they were trying to sleep in their Niboso and they were told not to and I would agree with that. We don't need to be wearing these for more than 15 minutes a night. It's not necessary. This is just to create some passive stretch. So imagine, would you be sitting in a stretch for 15 minutes even? Probably not. This is a very gentle way to create that passive space within the foot. So that's why we need to teach the body how to create that space on its own. Yeah. So after any time we do a passive stretch, we should always say, okay, how can I activate within that range now? That I now, my brain has been opened up to. My brain has felt like, okay, I can relax into this new open position. And so once we take the toe spacers off, that's when you want to start to open the toes naturally on your own. And you might, in the very, very beginning, it might be really difficult, but what we've seen from a lot of people that have have started to use toe spacers, all of a sudden they take it off and they're like, oh, my pinky moves. <laughs> so that's the toes. Also, I mean, we're talking about the foot more so here at the outside of the foot. And we talked about pronation and supination or the flattening and creating that arch in the foot. So we can always do things like sitting down, especially since it might not be super comfortable to do it in a loaded space position right away, but even sitting down and trying to push down and flatten that foot and then pull that arch up and create an arch in your foot. Again, might be something that's tough right away. For me, the flattening part is tough. <laughs> I really have to think and think about breathing and letting my foot relax down into the ground and then creating that arch. And you're going to notice how you feel this deep ache inside your foot after you do 10 or 15 reps of that. Yeah, and you're almost thinking of like, when you're in that sitting on the ground, watching your foot kind of flatten, you're almost thinking of this bone at the top of the foot kind of coming down and in. And that's gonna cause that a little bit more flattening of the foot, the stretch in the inside of that plantar fascia. And then we wanna think of that bone rotating out without lifting the ball of the mm -hmm. big foot or those toes. So without crunching or lifting the foot, like can we move this top of the foot in and out to create that midfoot lengthening and stretching and contracting without the heel and the ball of the foot moving. But just starting to get that that midfoot control is so important because then once we are able, we start to do our single leg balancing yeah. and we're starting to say, okay, how does my foot control in single leg balancing? So kicking off your shoes completely, no socks, no shoes, just barefoot on the ground, allowing that foot to start to gain more awareness, proprioception and feeling into the ground as we hold in that single leg and that's where we like to do some of those reaches forward side back in out you know all mm -hmm. these different reaches on a single leg it, again once you're able to tolerate this with no pain most of these activities we're talking about have to do with running in some sort or even dancing. You're doing a lot on single legs, especially when you're doing fancy moves. I've done some of those Zumba classes. They are hard and you do some pretty <laughs> tough things. And if we don't have control on one foot, or if you notice you stand on one foot and your foot and ankle are just going wild and it makes you feel like you need to fall over, that could be something that we need to work on. And that tells us that our foot muscles might not have the most amount of control when we are running and basically launching our body from foot to foot, you know? So how can we gain a little more control doing single leg balance stuff, starting to reach and tap with our op opposite foot like Jen was saying. And then once we get to that point, we talked earlier about plantar flexion and how a lot of this might happen because our plantar fascia is pulling at that fifth toe or that fifth metatarsal when we're in that plantar flexion and adduction, which happens when we launch off of our foot when we're running, we need to train that. So why don't we train heel raises? And there's so many different variations of heel raises we can do. You can just start on the ground and going up on your toes, trying to make sure that you don't let your ankles fall to the outside, keeping your ankles right in line with your big toe, going up and down, nice and controlled. The biggest thing is controlling on the way down. That's the eccentric or lengthening phase. Mm -hmm. And you can even get like a, a medium sized ball to hold between the ankles yeah, um, and do the heel raises that way because that's gonna help to retrain that pattern so that we're not falling to the outside of that foot and putting too much pressure into the pinky toe or that fifth metatarsal, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so getting that control back in the foot, getting that stability back in the midfoot, getting those toes to start to activate. You start to implement all these three areas as 
as tolerable, again, we're not pushing into pain, we're making sure that we're not in pain, but if you're starting to rebuild as you're in this waiting phase of getting back to your activity, you're gonna get back to your activity so much stronger with a different reaction within the foot so you don't continue to go down the line of continual stress fractures. Absolutely. and last thing with heel raises is starting to vary up your foot position so pointing toes in towards each other and then toes out and seeing how that feels and then elevating your toes so that you can do it from a depth so your heels can go down below your toes and then all the way up and that's going to start helping lengthen through that plantar fascia and then the back of the leg up through the calves even more to give your foot your ankle everything a little more space and the control within that space Hope you enjoyed that podcast and you got a little bit more out of it. And remember to grab your Neboso, use code OPTIMAL. You get 20% off, which is pretty incredible. They really feel good. You don't have to wear it for very long to make it really effective for your foot. And if you have more questions, drop them below. If you have more suggestions on podcasts that you need help with, things that you have going on within your body, please comment. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that bell so you don't miss out on future podcasts as well.